we'll put the lights down and uh, focus on God's word for the day. In the um, 19th chapter of Exodus, we read that Moses went up to God, the Lord having called him to the mountain, Mount Sinai, and saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, Tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the Israelites. Well, we are uh, rooted in relationship, and um, that's the theme for hearing God's word this morning. The, um, the congregation, as uh, Ron mentioned, is uh, grieving so many of us the, um, the death of our sister in Christ, Marilyn Horner. Uh, we celebrated her life on Friday, and... Um, you know, uh, we've thought a lot about what made her special. And uh, a great deal of the answer to that question of what made her special is found in three things. If you're filling out your outline in the bulletin and uh, focusing on the word that way this morning, there's three things that are lifted up, and I want to encourage you to see the importance of these three things. Certainly primary in Marilyn's life, primarily, uh, primary lifted up in this scripture, the importance of a place, a person, and a word to live by. Um, certainly for Maryland, the importance of this particular place that we are uh, gathering in, this uh, place called Atonement, has been uh, abundantly important. Her family was very close to the church uh, long before her husband Don died in 1973, uh, tragically of a car accident, leaving Marilyn at about age 40, 41 with six kids. And uh, she often shared that those were very bleak times, how she wanted to give up, how she wanted to quit. But every time the phone rang from an atonement friend who said, uh, I prayed for you today, she said she found just a little bit more strength to go on. You know, uh, last week we celebrated the ministries of the women of the church, and, um, and in many ways a lot of us would, would probably say, you know, Marilyn was kind of like the woman <laughs> of the church, and um, what, a, what a gift it has been to be the church with, with her. Now maybe you've had uh, special places in uh, your life where... You can point to uh, it being a setting where your faith took root and uh, grew. Um, it's a fascinating uh, idea that we come to this place today. Uh, last June, if you worshipped with us, we had a huge mountain here, and we, we decided not to erect it for one Sunday, but, but the place for the people of God this morning was Mount Sinai. And it's fascinating when we think about coming to that place with them where they received the Ten Commandments. Uh, thus far in September and now early into October, we've been uh, just burning through Genesis into Exodus. Story after story have been our worship themes, beginning with that, that epic story uh, at the near dawn of creation of Noah and jumping ahead to the call of God to particular people, how we said that, that we hear God or we experience God in our own lives, wanting things out of us. And that was our focus on Abraham, the spotlight shining on Abraham. We leapt ahead as we moved on in Genesis. We, we went over Isaac and Jacob and landed at Joseph, who uh, was the beginning of the story of the people of God in Egypt, first as a prisoner, Joseph there as a slave, and then the people of God in slavery during all of those generations of Egypt. The escape from Egypt, 
Dave uh, helped us part the Red Seas last Sunday. And now, as the people of God fled Egypt, they took a strange detour to a place that no one knew about that was called Mount Sinai. And that's where the word came to them. Well, what was that word? It begins in, a, in an enormously important way. This was the word that, that God spoke and said to Moses to tell the people that you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. This phrase, I brought you to myself, cannot be overemphasized. Notice that it, God didn't say, I brought you to Mount Sinai. I brought you to myself. This journey that we go on in, in our lives of faith, these places that may have significance for us are only important for one reason. God uses concrete places to bring us to a person, to bring us to himself. We've, we are awakened this morning. We, uh, we rubbed the sleep from our eyes. We said, I'm going to go to church. Maybe there's some that thought, oh, it'd be good to do something else, or even others that went under uh, protest. Somebody brought me to church. It doesn't matter because the, the church itself is only significant because of one thing. It's how God brings us to himself. So now you and I, we might have grown up in a culture and a time where going to church felt like a necessity. If our parents were like my parents, going to church was what you did. It wasn't a discussion, and, and therefore maybe in, in, in us was embedded a sense that we need to go to church. Uh, Sunday wouldn't feel like Sunday if I didn't go to church, and that's a good thing. It's just that today, in this day and age, it really doesn't work very well for very many people anymore because there's lots of good places to go on Sunday and there's lots of good things to do and the going to church only has significance for one reason it's how God brings us to himself and so I, I ask you to ask yourself this morning are you discovering what it means to be brought to the person of God it's a place but it's a person. And it's an emphasis on how God is at the center. You know, I, I got a lot of emails from Marilyn over the years. She and I were a team for, for nine years. And um, she was my scheduler and hundreds of emails. This was the last one I got. Typical of her email, she signed it the way she always did. God is good. She also liked to put a lot of question marks in her emails when I was confusing her, which I had a way of doing as she kept me on path. God is good. Everything begins with our relationship with God. God said, tell the people how I bore you on eagle's wings and I set you free from the land of slavery, and brought you to myself. Everything begins with that relationship. I can't think of a better scripture to launch our life groups this week than this one. It's, it wasn't planned this way. You know, we're following this narrative lectionary, the stories of God. This fall through the Old Testament, we land on this Sunday where we hear that God says, I brought you to myself. And we're launching these life groups that have this very simple pur purpose. Our life groups exist to help people find God-centered, authentic relationships. Because everything depends 
on relationship. The place is only important because of the relationship. And these relationships we have with others, where our life can be brought to bear with the story of God and the application of that story to our lives is exactly what God was doing when he brought the people to himself at Mount Sinai. How is God bringing you to himself? How is he rooting you in relationships? We still have room in our life groups. You heard this morning that we want to think about this Bible study that meets every morning on Sundays as a life group. Even though it's a little different, it's going to be dropping and there will be a little more coming and going in this life group. But we just want to insist that everybody try to find space for two things every week, an hour to worship God and an hour to apply that word in relationship with others. And maybe the only time you could be part of a life group is Sunday morning, so it's there at 9.15. Eventually, we'll probably have additional Sunday opportunities in addition to the, I don't know, we have five or six groups meeting this week. There's room for a few more. You can see on the easel if you want to sign up. So it was a person a place, and a word. And the word continued uh, when God spoke through Moses. Tell the people, he said, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, God said, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Right after God says, I brought you to myself, he doesn't say, I've done this for you. He says, I've done this for the world. I'm doing this through you for the world. We don't go to church as we used to say in the inner city, just to shout the blues away. It's good to shout the blues away sometimes, but it's not for us. God says, out of all the peoples of the earth, all of whom belong to me, those who receive my covenant and my word will be for the world a priestly nation. Have you ever thought of yourself as part of a priestly nation? Nation, What in the world could that mean? Well, as persons who are connected to a Lutheran tradition, we have an insight from the Catholic priest Martin Luther who shook the world when he said to the church hierarchy of his day 500 years ago, the church was never meant to be a class system where priests are up here, the educated elite, and the people down here. He said the church is at its best when we recognize we are a priesthood of all believers. What would it look like if you and I are a priest together? I always say you can call me pastor if you need to, but I like it when you call me Greg because it reminds me that you know that we're in this together that you and I are priests, and if we are priests, how might that be reflected in what we do? Well, what do priests do when at their best? They care for others. They listen. They've spent time seeking God's wisdom and want to share that wisdom with others. They bring people together. They serve. How is God making a priest of your life? It's something that Marilyn knew at the depth of her being. Directing traffic in so many ways in this congregation for so many years. She didn't sit back and wait for me. She usually told me. <laughs> and I was grateful. My wife asked the day after she died, I'm sitting at the kitchen table, I got my head down. She says, who was Marilyn's best friend at atonement? It was a very thoughtful question. I moped and I groaned. I said, me. And I knew that wasn't true. Having been here 52 years, 
and a charter member. She had many, many, many friends that um, were her best friends. But after all that we had done together for those nine years, in so many ways, uh, even if I wasn't her best friend, she was mine. Because she got busy doing things that she knew would please God. What are you doing? What are we doing in our lives that we hope will be pleasing to God? It's time to get busy. And be busy. You know, Marilyn died once uh, 50 years ago. I didn't know that. I, I, I remember her saying something about it, but her son at our planning meeting said, that, that Marilyn had come to him in a dream three days after she died. And in the dream, she told her son, tell him, tell me. Tell him what, he says. <laughs> he doesn't want his mom to bother him in the middle of the night in a dream after she died. <laughs> tell him what? Well, tell him that I died 50 years ago. I don't think he knows. Well, I did remember vaguely she told me one day we were getting ready for faith during the kitchen, and she said, Greg, did I tell you that I died once? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. It was just like they say, the bright lights, and Jesus spoke to me. Oh, okay, Marilyn, how are those beans coming along? You know, we were always busy, and she didn't really want to talk about it that much anyway. What did Jesus tell you? He told me 50 years ago, your work is not done yet. She remembered all that when she came back. Now, as for you and I, our work is not done. What will we do? It's God's story. It's our story. Thanks be to God.